Welcome to the Real Vision Defiant weekly show where we talk about the hottest stories in the digital asset space. I'm Ash Bennington in for Robin Schmidt, who's on assignment today. Very pleased to be here with Cami Russo, Chief S at the Defiant. Cami, welcome. Hey, Ash. Thanks so much. Great to be here again. It's a pleasure to have you. Cami, lots happening. It's Fed Day. Lots of other things in the news cycle. What's at the top of your screen today? Yeah, well, I think everyone in the market is uh, watching, uh, seeing what, what the Fed will do. Um, I think, you know, all the smart money is is betting on, on, a, on a rate hike. Um, is it a, a quarter of the a, a point that kind of the that, that that's priced in at the moment? Uh, so we'll see whether that uh, that that's the case. Uh, if it's even higher, or or if they decide not to hike, um, I I don't know. Like wh what's what are your thoughts there, Ash? Like, do you think that the market is prepared for? Uh, for a more uh, kind of constrictive uh, monetary policy? Is it going to freak out after the rate hike or, or or is everything kind of already priced in? Well, you know, Cami, that is the $20 trillion question that people are wondering about. Look, I think it's pretty well priced in that we're going to get a rate hike. We have inflation here uh, at 40 year highs. So there's mm -hmm. general consensus uh, about the fact that there is going to be some tightening or perhaps more uh, appropriately said a withdrawal of this incredibly uh, ultra accommodative monetary policy that we've had since the 2007 2008 period, uh, except for a you know a brief blip uh, when rates attempted to be raised and then got pulled back down to the zero bound with COVID. You know exactly as you said, Cami. This question uh, about whether it's going to be 25 or 50 uh, that really is what people are going to be looking for today. Uh, but irrespective of what today's number is, uh, it seems highly likely that we're going to see a succession of uh, rate hikes to attempt to get inflation under control. Obviously, that is the portion of the dual mandate that seems to be most saliently problematic uh, in the U.S. economy right now. But let's talk a little bit about what the, the uh, expectations are uh, going into this for digital asset prices. You know, in Bitcoin, we saw a dip below 40,000 uh, a week ago today, last Wednesday, and it's essentially been range bound ever since, mostly between 37 and 41 K. Uh, on uh, dollars on the price side, you know, th this is remarkably range bound uh, for Bitcoin, relatively stable. Uh, it, it almost has this uh, feel of, of markets just waiting to see what happens and what uh, gets telegraphed next. After all, it has been a very long time since we've seen, uh, you know, rates at uh, a normalized level based on a, like a Taylor rule calculation. That may be a little bit of jargon, but the point here is uh, rates have been incredibly low for a very long period of time, essentially for the entire period where we've been talking about digital assets. Uh, so I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens next, Cami. It's clear that everyone is watching to see how crypto reacts to an environment where rates are not as, at zero and where there is not kind of trillions of dollars being pushed into the economy in, in these massive uh, stimulus programs. Um, we're seeing kind of monetary policy become more restrictive for the first time uh, since kind of there there was crypto. Yeah. So it's it's going to be interesting to see for sure. Spot on, Cami, and very well framed. We are truly in uncharted waters here. Uh, never been in this situation during the crypto age before. Cami, I want to shift gears here a little bit and talk about the Biden executive order over at the Defiant. You guys are covering this story very closely. Let me read the headline you guys went with, because I think it's really instructive. Quote, crypto community relieved by Biden orders balance, yet wary as oversight regime takes shape. Cami, tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about this. Yeah, so I think the the you know overall reaction to this executive order was, you know, as we said there, um, just like a sigh of relief. It, this has been just a, a, a looming risk over over crypto. Um, this kind of uh, fact that the U.S. was going to come out with uh, just like more broad crypto regulation. And there was this fear that, uh, you know, anything could happen, you know, that yeah. uh, Biden could say, you know, uh, crypto is uh, is illegal or just like uh, go out very strongly against the space. Um, 
But what we got instead was this very balanced executive order, which recognized that it, it is important for the U.S. to remain at the forefront of innovation, um, which recognized the potential for crypto to provide more universal financial access. Um, and, you know, those were kind of the two, one of the two main points in, in the order. In addition to providing, of course, consumer protection, which is always going to be a focus in right. in regulators, uh, so that that was expected. So, all in all, uh, very very positive news. So the 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 bottom line is, crypto is not getting banned in the U.S. Um, the U.S. is looking at at the space in a very kind of balanced, constructive way. It recognizes its potential. Um, so it's great. I think, you know, just a note of caution uh, within kind of the like optimistic uh, news is that the devil is in the details and that while that's kind of the direction of the executive order, now right. the like working groups need to actually kind of sit down and uh, and figure out what their policy recommendations are. So it's still kind of yet to be seen what uh, exactly those policies will be. So maybe, you know, th there is kind of room for them to be uh, more restrictive or less restrictive. So that's kind of TBD. Um, but just like on the face of it, uh, I think it's it's hugely positive. Yeah, now it's time to do the work. Let me ask you this. Is there anything that you saw uh, in this executive order that you thought uh, were you were particularly constructive on? Or is it just the fact that this executive order sort of has been signed and that we're moving forward that gives you cause for optimism? You know, the, the fact that one, uh, we're finally moving forward with a integrated regulatory framework for crypto that spans yeah. all the official bodies in the US yeah. and agencies. I think it's great because what we've seen, um, you know, in, in years past is that each agency has its own specific view about crypto. So the SEC will say everything is a security. Um, the CFTC will say Bitcoin and Ether are commodities. Um, I don't, there's like there's tax uh, frameworks for, for crypto. So it, it, it's been kind of, kind of like a very fragmented um, yeah take and, and framework for, for crypto. So it's great to see just like a unified effort where hopefully everything and all agencies are, are working together and under kind of the, the, the same uh, view. Um, and, and, you know, it's what the space has always needed, which is clarity, you know, regulatory clarity, seeing where ev everyone stands, uh, what's, what's allowed, what's not. So, I think that that's kind of what's what's so positive about this. Yeah, uh, fragmented is exactly the right word, and the search for clarity is something that we hear about whenever we talk to people in the space. And I'm sure uh, you guys over at the Defiant hear it too. Talking of fragmentation and consolidation, Yuga Labs, the company behind Board Ape Yacht Club, acquired the intellectual property of CryptoPunks and MeBits from Larva Labs. A huge story in the NFT space. Kami, for people who don't follow this space as closely as you do, what's the significance here? Why does it matter? So this is such a huge story, you know. Um, so for, for context, uh, Larva Labs are the creators of CryptoPunks, and CryptoPunks is one of the first um, NFT uh, projects. I think they were uh, created back in 2017, uh, I, I believe they were kind of the first together with uh, Crypto Kitties, and they were pretty kind of dormant for a while, but really took off uh, last year as kind of a status symbol. You know, people who owned uh, CryptoPunks um, owned one of the, the very first NFT collections, and um, just like the, the, the price of, of these tokens really has soared into the, the several millions. And, and so it's it's really become kind of uh, the, the way to signal that you are kind of in the club, you know. Right. Um, but then Bored Apes Yacht Club, uh, which is created by Yuga Labs, started kind of competing head-to-head uh, -head with CryptoPunks as kind of the, the most sought-after uh, NFT. And, um, and a, a big part of that is because interestingly, of the IP structure, uh, the difference in intellectual property structures for both projects. Um, so for Bored Apes, where, where they innovate is that uh, holders of the NFT hold the, um, the IP 
of the NFT itself, which means that they can commercialize the um, the image, like the asset. Uh, they can, you know, do whatever. They they can sell T-shirts of their board ape. They can create a video game based on on the board apes they hold. Um, while for CryptoPunks, the artist uh, owns. Um, it, it's not the holder that owns uh, that IP, so they can't really kind of commercialize or build upon uh, the NFTs that, that they own. And that that was generating a premium on Bored Apes. And last year, we covered at the Defiant how um, Bored Apes were overtaking CryptoPunks and uh, and passing the the floor price, which is, you know, the floor price is kind of the, the, the cheapest price that you can get one of these uh, tokens for. Um, so it's in that context with like board apes becoming these like just like hugely successful project. Right. There's been over a, a billion dollars of trading volume for uh, mm. for board apes. Um, there was some news leaked that uh, Yuga Labs was raising money at like a five billion dollar valuation. So it's just become this like juggernaut in in the NFT space. Um, and so it's with this kind of newfound power that they were able to acquire kind of the crown jewel of, of the space, uh, which is uh, CryptoPunks. Yeah, it's truly fascinating. And again, very early in the space, talking about intellectual property, the uses for the intellectual property, how the owners of that intellectual property can capitalize on it. It's extremely early days, isn't it? Yeah, um, it's it's so fascinating because we're seeing you know these discussions about intellectual property and um and it's so different from what we what we've seen in kind of the traditional art world you know because yeah. when you when you own a, a piece of art yeah you you own the the, um, the the art but but you don't own the intellectual property like obviously the artist does but here like nfts are really changing the game they're they're kind of enabling the holder to actually really truly own the piece um so you know it's it's opening up a, a whole new way of uh, of understanding digital yeah. ownership yeah opening up a whole new way of understanding and opening up new potential uh, to develop that intellectual property in ways that have never been done in the past yeah i agree um i think you know one kind of um, caveat here to point out is that while this is great for for holders I don't know if it's so great for artists, you know, it's right. like, you know, it, it leaves them a little bit less uh, protected, um, though there is kind of ways to make up for that. You know, there's kind of the, the ability to um, to include in the smart contract a way so that the artist is always earning royalties from the right. trading of, of these works. So it's not like the artist completely loses out, but... I'd imagine as as a creator to kind of, you know, relinquish the the rights to exploit your own work is is a bit kind of, I don't know, aggressive, I, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of a whole kind of new way of of doing things. Yeah, I think that's very well said. And look, I think again, chapter one here, I expect that there are going to be new structures where artists are going to be able to retain uh, residual economic interests in the uh, works that they create. I suspect that is going to be something that we're going to see coming. Uh, in the very near future. Kami, you said uh, NFTs are a way to signal membership in the club. You are definitely a member of the club. Folks who are not uh, a member of the club may be some members of the European Parliament. Uh, let's talk a little bit what's happening in Europe. It seems as though the most controversial provision uh, from Mika, this is the, uh, the Digital Assets Act uh, in the European Parliament, uh, that could have potentially banned Bitcoin has in effect been removed from the legislation. This is a very complex legislative process that's happening over there right now. How would you explain it uh, to someone who hasn't been following this story? I think it's just baffling this view that the uh, EU, not, not the EU, but uh, the, the lawmakers um, presenting this, uh, this proposal, um, the stance that they're taking. So what as i understand it uh, law, lawmakers in the eu are proposing effectively a ban on proof of work because of its environmental impact so you know they're, they're saying um cryptocurrencies which are based on a consensus algorithm that is hurtful for the environment should 
kind of transition into a new consensus algorithm, uh, which is, is less harmful. So an effective, I mean, effectively saying uh, proof of work needs to be scrapped for proof of stake. Um, which, you know, to me, like one, it's it's really, uh, it's, it's crazy to, to see um, these lawmakers taking a, a position that's like taking sides in 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 this debate, which has been so uh, controversial, kind of saying that um, cryptocurrencies are uh, are 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 so and and kind of spending too too much energy and and so on, um, and it it just kind of reflects a what I believe is is kind of a lack of understanding on how these technologies actually work because what they're saying is you know like bitcoin should just go go ahead and change to proof of stake and that's kind of clearly not understanding how how this um, actually works it's not like you know it's not like microsoft can just like issue a patch on its software it's like this entire ecosystem that needs to agree on a change of its consensus algorithm um so yeah it, it was it was a bit baffling to see uh, this regulation, and it was in stark contrast with uh, with you know what the U.S. is doing, which you know for at, at least for now seems like it's a a, a much more measured kind of thoughtful uh, approach to crypto um, than than kind of these lawmakers saying, oh no, like proof of work is is too environmentally um, harmful, like you should just change <laughs> to to proof of stake. Yeah, baffling seems like the right choice of words. By the way, this is the European Parliament that's headquartered in Strasbourg, France, uh, and MICA stands for the Markets in Crypto Assets Framework. It's much broader uh, than just this provision about potentially banning proof-of-work coins. But let me ask you this, Cami. Obviously, ESG is an incredibly hot topic in Europe right now, something that's not going away anytime soon, even though this provision has been stripped out of the potential legislation. How do you see this debate unfolding as we go forward You know, into the future? Um, ESG in, in crypto, I think, you know, it's, so I, I believe there are uh, market solutions to this, uh, fortunately, because, you know, there, there are proof of work based uh, networks, but there's also uh, many proof of stake networks that are emerging. Um, notably, you know, Ethereum uh, is is transitioning to proof of stake. Um, there are many other EVM chains and other smart contracts uh, platforms that are based on proof of stake or or proof of stake like kind of um, consensus mechanism. So, you know, if if people value um, that and 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 value the fact that the the network is less uh, is um, needs less energy. To, to work, then you know those networks and those tokens will become more valuable and and be more used. But if Bitcoin is seeing uh, adoption and, and demand, it, it means that there's people who believe that the energy that is spent in securing Bitcoin is worth it. And I mean, honestly, just like my personal opinion, I I 100% agree. Um, I think, you know, like. Bitcoin is a revolutionary technology. It's it's a digital gold. It's uh, it's censorless money. It's the first uh, cryptocurrency network which allows uh, uh, people to access um, a, a financial system in in a permissionless way without needing uh, intermediaries. That's a huge, huge innovation and and revolution. And now it, with the Russia Ukraine conflict, we see more than ever why something like this is needed. So I absolutely believe that you know the energy that's put in to secure the Bitcoin network uh, is worth it. Like Bitcoin is definitely worth it. And there's also kind of um, nuances here because uh, e even if uh, Bitcoin requires a lot of energy, not all of that energy comes from fossil fuels. A lot of that is green energy. So, you know, that that's that's something to, to consider. Um, and that uh, I think often gets uh, overlooked in in the debate. So, you know, um, I, I think crypto is kind of um, uh, 
this free free market and i think you know the market will uh, decide whether people think uh, uh these environmental concerns are are actually uh, worth going to other proof of stake chains uh, or not yeah very well framed uh, and we should say that there are people uh, who clearly advocate for this notion that green energy renewable energy is going to be stimulated uh, by Bitcoin and by some of the things that are happening in the space. Also, I should probably point out that there are other aspects of this legislation right now, uh, preventing money laundering, uh, terrorist financing, and other types of criminal activity that uh, this bill also seeks to work out. As we go around the world here, there's a really interesting story coming out of South Korea. Uh, South Korea has just elected its first crypto-friendly president, Yoon Sok Yul. Uh, I was reading a piece written by our friends over at Forecast News who cover Asia very closely. Here's what's being talked about in South Korea. Uh, basically, legislation that's friendly toward ICOs, revamp taxation, and investor protection. A staggering 10% of Koreans own cryptocurrency. Kemi, what are your thoughts? Um, it'll be such an interesting shift for South Korea. I, I remember back in um, the 2017 bull run, um, South Korea was at the center of it because uh, I think there's, as I understand it from kind of my, my reporting at the time, um, crypto is very kind of aligned culturally with, with South Korea. Uh, South Koreans, you know, they, they, um, they really like investing and um, and speculating and and gambling. It's just like part of the culture. So like ICOs were were very popular at the time, and that that really prompted a um, a very kind of strict and harsh regulatory response. Um, so ICOs were banned, and and the, there was in in general just um, a. a a, a kind of anti-crypto stance uh, from South Korean uh, authorities and, and regulations uh, ever since. So this will be a, a huge kind of change if if it's true that you know this pro-crypto uh, new new president kind of actually enforces and and just like uh, changes that that uh, those uh, those rules and and regulations. So I, I think that's uh, yet yet to be seen. Um, but you know, I think kind of giving the um, having friendly regulation in a country that is already so uh, predisposed and 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 that likes crypto so much and where like a a large percentage owns crypto um will we'll just kind of continue to to fuel th this market there by the way speaking of people who like crypto i wanted to end with this story elon musk uh, on a tweet thread with michael saylor uh talking about inflation had this to say quote as a general principle, for those who are looking for advice from this thread, meaning in the context of inflation, it is generally better to own physical things like a home or stock in a company you think make good products than dollars when inflation is high. I still own and won't sell my Bitcoin, Ethereum, or Doge for what it's worth. That's kind of Elon being Elon in the the defiance uh, end of your content. We had a, a list of top defiers, and I think we named him Crypto Twitter King. Um, so now he's you know exerting his power. <laughs> um, and listen, I think he's kind of saying what what's on a lot of people's minds at the time. Like it's it's a scary time. Um, there's a war going on. There's a kind of record high inflation in the US. I think, you know, that's what a lot of people are doing, just like going out of cash, going into hard assets. Um, and and for many people, kind of crypto has been a hedge uh, against all this uh, volatility and, and uncertainty in, in the market. Um, and I mean, the other thing to note about that tweet is that Elon owns ETH and Doge. Well, I guess like we knew he he owned Doge, and of course, like he 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 was he had a Doge CEO on his Twitter bio for <laughs> for a long time. Um, but yeah, of note is that he has confirmed that he owns ETH. So yeah, a lot of kind of the Ethereum community was understandably freaking out uh, about that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Cami, always a pleasure to have you back on Real Vision on this show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Ash. This was great. Thanks for watching, everyone.